Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Annie Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. And today, just before we get started, I just thought I'd warn you that we have a very poorly puppy. He is wanting lots of hugs. So if you hear jingling or heavy breathing, I promise it's not us. It's the puppy who we are sat here giving lots and lots of strokes and hugs to. Okay, so today we are looking at The Quiet Room by Laurie Schiller and Amanda Bennett. Goodreads gave it a 4.01 stars with 6,304 ratings and 303 reviews. Amazon gave it 4.7 stars from 64 reviews. Sydney gave it 4 stars. I gave it 5 stars. It's actually my favourite book we've read so far. And the blurb says that at 17, Laurie Schiller was the perfect child, the only daughter of an affluent, close-knit family. Six years later, she made her first suicide attempt, then wandered the streets of New York City, dressed in ragged clothes, tormenting voices crying out in her mind. Laurie Schiller had entered the horrifying world of full-blown schizophrenia. She began an ordeal of hospitalizations, halfway houses, relapses, more suicide attempts and constant withering despair, but against all odds she survived. Now, in this personal account, she tells how she did it, taking us not only into her own shattered world, but drawing on the words of the doctors who treated her and the family members who suffered with her. In this new edition, Laurie recounts the dramatic years following the original publication, a period involving addiction, relapse and ultimately love and recovery. Moving harrowing and ultimately uplifting, The Quiet Room is a classic testimony to the ravages of mental illness and the power of perseverance and courage. So there is a lot of stuff that happens in this book. So this is another book that is a real life story. So this is the story of Laurie's, who is diagnosed with schizophrenia after being wrongly diagnosed with other conditions. She is 17 when she starts to hear the voices And she spends quite a lot of time during her life trying to deny the fact that she is mentally sick. And even though Laurie is the one who suffers from the schizophrenia, it does involve her entire family. It also involves the friends and other people she meets and everyone around her. And instead of us going through every single thing that Laurie went through, we are going to pick up on the things that we thought were the most important. So we're going to look at the stigma associated with schizophrenia, particularly back in the 1980s. We're going to look at how her family dealt with her diagnosis and her symptoms. We're also then going to look at the history and the treatment associated with mental health conditions back in the 80s and what has happened or what happened towards the end of Laurie's treatment during this time and the fantastic new drug that she's put onto and the fact that now Laurie has met her dream man who she calls Mr Wonderful and is actually out in society doing things that she wants to do and managing the voices. I really like the fact that we have picked up this book uh, after it's republished due to the addition of these years since the original book and um. That's because I think it would have been really sad to have ended this in the cycle um, that she finds herself in of attempted suicides, hospitalisation, medication, some kind of life, then back to attempted suicide and and this cycle that she is in. Whereas Mm -hmm. we do seem to see the bit where she finds uh, a way of... Tolerating everything, isn't it? Yeah, and coping with her condition and accepting that it isn't a matter of a short-term breakdown and then back to what it was what we might call normality but it's actually an ongoing battle for her every day and the fact that she's not necessarily what you could consider cured but she is able to manage her symptoms as a result of this fantastic new drug that they put her on and also the way that the people at the end of the book 
treat her as a human being rather than what she has to go through in the acute hospital setting. Yeah, and I do. I think the story shows us actually how you are treated by the professionals and by your family it has a real impact on the way you deal with your mental health illness and the way that you either can or can't accept what's going on. And with that, I think we should start by discussing the issues with stigma in this book. First of all, surrounding maybe her family. So yeah, it's really the way that her family deals with the stigma associated with mental illness. So her father, Marvin, is a trained psychologist. So someone that you would assume would be in the know about these kind of things and mental illness in general. And the fact that as a result of all of his training, he knows the consequences of having a mental health diagnosis attached to a person and how that follows them through their entire lives. Yeah, and at first he tries to think that this is a short-term breakdown and then things will go back to normal. So he doesn't want it to affect her life in the long run. So he tries to hide the fact that she's having the mental health issues in the first place. I also think that Some of the denial from the family could be because Laurie herself is also denying the fact that she is so ill. So we find out that she starts to hear voices when she's 17 and they abate for a while, but then they come back with full force as she is at Tufts College. And as a result of them coming back, she finds it even harder to hide the fact that she is hearing these nasty derogatory voices that are telling her to kill herself to kill other people and just deal with them on a day-to-day basis which is something i can't even comprehend and i think unless you actually have schizophrenia or a similar diagnosis where you hear voices i think to be able hearing them and trying to understand the the constant chatter is is very difficult to to imagine Exactly, particularly when you are thinking that these voices are coming from the outside and not from inside your own head. So there's quite a lot of discussion about Laurie being concerned that other people will hear the fact that these voices are calling her all sorts of horrible names and are telling her about the the world that is going on around her and it are very abusive in yeah. some ways towards her aren't and they? especially when she sometimes says they're so loud she can't believe other people can't hear them because it's all she can hear i think it's interesting in part of the book where she meets someone else in the hospital with schizophrenia and and she says why is it that that person's schizophrenia their voices tell them jokes and mine tell me abuse like and that it occurred to me that yeah, why why are those are they different? derogatory? Yeah, why yeah. are they derogatory? Is it is it something to do with an upbringing? Is it something to do with a psychology, or is it just bad luck with the kind of schizophrenia she's got? Probably more bad luck, I think. Yeah, for Laurie. But going back to her dad, hmm. who is the psychologist, and it is important to note that when he had his psychology training, it was back in the 1950s. And their school of thought was that the reason why someone would develop mental health issues is because of their upbringing. And so that automatically means that it is Marvin and Nancy, who is Laurie's mum, it's their fault that she is the way she currently is. And this is one of the biggest reasons why he finds it so hard to accept that she has a long-term mental health issue. Because if it is a long-term serious mental health issue then he must have done something very wrong or not done something that he should have done in her childhood to cause this to happen and he starts analyzing what happened in her childhood was he too demanding on her because he always expected you know good grades and and wanted her to go to college and uni and so maybe it was too much pressure is it you know what else had he done and and I think that is kind of eating at him and it finds he finds it very hard to accept that she has it because he can't understand why. And all of that creates such a sense of shame. And I think that shame is one of the most difficult emotions just to sit and deal with on a regular basis. The fact that you know that there is something that you could have done differently that would have made Laurie better. Yeah, and especially as one of the brothers says, you know, they live in a, a nice area of America. They're town is very much you know divorces are hidden teenage pregnancies hidden hidden, you know pregnancy outside of marriage it's all uh you know meant to be under the carpet yeah 
And so a mental health illness is swept under as well. So they don't, no one talks about it. And that's one of the other biggest issues is even within their family, they don't talk to the boys about why this is happening or what's happening. So their two sons feel isolated and um, don't feel they're getting enough attention. And partly because they just don't understand what's going on with Laurie. Because they're not discussing it no. in any way, shape or form between yeah. them. And also the fact that Marvin, which is Laurie's dad, is dead set against Nancy, which is Laurie's mum, reaching out and telling anyone around her what is happening. So she herself also doesn't get any support from friends and family that would probably have been there if she was allowed to talk about it. Yeah, they they tell people that Laurie is off on holiday or she's off do it, she's off staying somewhere else rather than actually saying, look, she's in hospital and she's having real mental health issues, you know. And, and if she'd broken her leg and she'd been in hospital, they would have done. That's what gets me. It's because it's mental health that they haven't told anybody. But I do think that even today there is stigma attached to having a mental health issue. And there are people out there that are constantly talking about the fact that, hey, I'm one of those one in four that has a mental health condition. But yet, unfortunately, I don't know if you saw recently in the newspapers that someone who was attending accident emergency because they had attempted to end their own life was told that if they were really serious about it they would have already done it which i think is completely shocking and that's in 2017 that's something that i would have expected back in the 1980s when this book is set and you hear jeremy hunt who's saying you know that the mental health services that they're providing at the moment are 10 times better than it was when he first became health secretary so even though we are talking There seems to be this issue where the messages aren't getting through to some people. Yeah, no, definitely. And don't get me wrong, I completely understand that in the media things get sensationalised and if it bleeds, it leads because that's what sells. And I really hope that this is an isolated incident. And I'm also not tarnishing the whole of the NHS with the same brush here because as with all large organisations, there is usually people in it that say things that isn't representative of the entirety of that organisation. And on a whole, staff within the NHS do a fantastic job. It's The problem is, it's the system that they're constrained within. But just thinking that it's okay to say those things to an individual who is in crisis is completely wrong. And really, nothing can really justify what they actually said to this person. It could be because they have a lack of understanding of mental health. It could also be that they have their own prejudice against people that are suffering with mental health. There are a multitude of reasons, but really it shouldn't have been said full stop. And I do understand that primary care is put under such pressure to deal with people. And it may seem that someone with a mental health crisis is a burden upon them, but that still doesn't mean you should take it out on that person. Maybe this person was having a really bad day. It's not uncommon for us to see in the news media and have reports from NHS staff of the fact that they are routinely abused by patients and physically harmed by some patients. And not to mention the emotional harm that patients can do because these people are human as well and they have their own mental health struggles. And I think as well because schizophrenia especially is seen as a person is seen as dangerous she felt that, you know, Laurie talks about how some people, when they found out, would would see her as a threat, as if she's going to suddenly flip out at them and hurt them. And that's not what this is about. And she never hurts anyone else. She hurts herself because she doesn't want to hurt anybody else, because she doesn't want... She just wants the voices to stop telling her to do nasty things, but she doesn't listen. Well, she, she, she does listen. She doesn't do all the things that they are telling her to do. But that's one of the reasons she feels that she has to attempt suicide because she needs them to stop and she feels they obey afterwards. So I think that brings us nicely onto the fact that I believe that the fact that the parents cannot accept the diagnosis or the fact that this is a serious mental health issue early on means that Laurie's own acceptance and the way that she gets treatment is affected and delays all of that. Yeah, because there are points in the book where there are certain things that her parents encourage her to do because they think it's in her best interest really is not the best thing for her to be doing at the time. So, for example, there is a part in the book where she is encouraged to 
do what would be our online dating. So the the pre Tinder <laughs> and the pre Plenty of Fish and yes, all of those where you went along and you recorded a video and then you went quaint. and watched other people's videos and waited for people to contact you. And her parents, especially her mother, encourages her to do this because she thinks, well, if she finds love, everything will be cured. And unfortunately, <laughs> though, if you've read some of the books that we've read recently, it does seem to have that message that if there is a significant other in the situation then things automatically get better. Love is the cure for everything. And I think that's, yeah, (laughs) yeah. I think that's probably one of the things that I'm starting to notice, particularly with some of the books aimed at young adults, is the fact that there are this mis-message. Yeah. That they are suggesting that if you find love, your mental health will be better. Which it could be in some cases, but to be honest, in reality, it probably isn't. You need to be able to well, deal with the your cure. own. It yeah. might help, and having support from somebody might help. Or it um, might hinder. Having somebody to accept you might help, but at the same time, yeah, it might hinder. I know that some of my exes have definitely hindered my mental health at times. <laughs> and we see the hindrance in Am I Normal Yet with teenage boys and yeah. their tendencies towards certain behaviours rather than emotional support. yeah. But the parents in this one encourage Laurie to make this video and to try and get herself out onto the dating scene. They also encourage her to go on holiday. So she's been hospitalised already as a result of trying to attempt suicide twice. She's been on acute units in hospital, which the parents didn't want her to go on to, but eventually decided that maybe it would be best for Laurie if she was admitted into hospital. She is then told that there is this fantastic opportunity that they're all going to South America. It's going to be people from her old college that are going to go down and they're going to have an amazing time and that she should go and join them. And yeah, it's as if this holiday will, again, cure everything. That she will go along, she'll have a good relax, she'll have a nice time, she'll be happy, she'll come home and everything will be sorted. Unfortunately, she has one of the most horrific holidays I've probably ever heard of. So she has been prescribed medication. So she's given several diagnoses during this book and she is on medication. And while she is away, it turns out that the people that she is on this holiday with are not who she expected. They are not people that are her own age and they do not share the same interests that she does. So she kind of finds that she feels very isolated on this holiday And she then also decides to stop taking the medication that she had been given. So unfortunately, the voices come back with a vengeance. And so she decides that perhaps taking drugs will be the way to try and lessen the voices. And this is a, you know, the drugs theme goes through in several areas of the book. She does seem to try and find escape through her own prescriptions, basically, of drugs and alcohol, which seems quite common in mental health issues because... It's a, it's self-medicating. It is trying to dull down those voices that she's hearing when the medication isn't working. Or when she stops taking the medication. Yeah. And so she ends up taking the medica- um, not taking the medication. She is offered drugs and she accepts them because... Why not? Why not? Try and, and see if that works. And she ends up meeting someone and he... He offers her drugs, but he says that she needs to come in his taxi and he needs to drive her places. And she puts herself into a situation that she may not have normally put herself into yeah. if she was in what would con- be considered her normal state yeah, of mind. Yeah, she's a vulnerable person at this time. She's somebody who actually needs to be supported. And I think because she's feeling so vulnerable and alone and isolated... Somebody saying, I want to spend some time with you. She even, jumps, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, she jumps at that chance. And it does mean that she ends up putting herself in a situation where... And she, we're not victim blaming here. It's, no. This man should never have touched her inappropriately because this is what this happens. Is what she ends up in being sexually assaulted by this man. And we're not saying that she shouldn't have put herself in that position. But I don't know about you, but if I was thinking clearly i probably would have said no in that situation yeah i wouldn't have got in the taxi but 
yeah, you're right. He should never have done what he did. And him out there is shame on you. And you... It, you took advantage of someone that was in a vulnerable position. Yeah. And she might not have put herself in that position if she was, or she might have done. She, we you don't not, know. No. But she is a vulnerable person, and she has to then deal with not only the fact that she is off her medication, she's dealt with, with, with drugs, and she's been sexually assaulted, and she is isolated in this holiday on her own. And so she ends up in a absolute worse state than when she started this holiday. And in some ways, it can be put down to the fact that her parents pushed her and encouraged her to go in the first place. Yeah. From a parental point of view, I can see that they were trying to help. They were trying to get her to have new experiences and enjoy life and and do things that she would enjoy. Because, you know, those are piece of advice you're given when you have a mental health illness you know go and do something you'd really enjoy and oh you liked that you know you liked the last holiday so why not go out and try it again but again it's the naivety from her parents that actually she was really unwell that was causing this kind of how to explain it this misguided assumptions that if you just did normal things it would be fine yeah And I think that's where they are not accepting this is a very serious mental health illness. And it does take to a point where one of the doctors, when Laurie is being treated, has to turn around and point blank say to her parents, look, Laurie is really unwell. You need to face facts and that the fact might be that she may not get better. Because these are very supportive and loving parents. They're just not being supportive in uh, in the right way for what she needs. Yeah. And until they can accept it, they can't support Laurie in the way that she needs to be supported. And that's such a shame. It is such a shame. And also the fact that if people around you are also not accepting the fact that you're ill, I'm not going to be the one that goes, well, I am ill or I, I would be on their side. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean... Dealing with your own mental health illness, and I myself included, being accepting that mental health illness is the same sort of sickness as any other sickness when uh, it happens is very difficult. And it's usually only the other people around you reassuring you that they also believe that you are sick and this is okay and don't have to blame yourself. It is just, it is being sick. You need that from others. And Laurie doesn't get that. And she doesn't accept herself. No. She She gets some acceptance when she's in one of the halfway houses with people that are there that are experiencing the same things, but then they take her down the route of... More um, drug taking. More drug taking, yeah. And and finding other routes to, you know, self-medicate rather than accepting the professional help that she needs. Also, when she finally does get the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis of schizophrenia, there is this stigma associated with the diagnosis itself. So her mum, Nancy says that when they hear that she is diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and then later on schizophrenia, she automatically jumps to the fact that she thinks that, oh my goodness, my daughter has multiple personalities or what we would call disassociative identity disorder today. And that is obviously the wrong diagnosis, but that is what she has heard. And so in her mind, she automatically associates schizophrenia with something that is completely a completely different mental health condition but back then it was considered the same thing and there isn't a very good understanding of what schizophrenia is it is a lot of people believe that it is multiple personalities and they do the same with borderline personality disorder as well yeah so i think it's been maybe it's because it's one of those things that has been more popularized by popular culture it's in movies more it's in news more it's in tv more than perhaps other mental health conditions it is and then it's not necessarily portrayed in the way that it actually is experienced so therefore people do think that it is where people hear voices and they think they're different characters and and they go out and murder people there's always the bad one that goes out and kills someone and there's always the child personality that is vulnerable and needs looking after and there's always a another sadistic one and there's it's it's not stereotyped. Yeah. yeah. It it's is not definitely that. stereotyped. And, and that is partly due to the media and partly due to a lack of understanding. And that's one thing I really gained from this book was an insight into what schizophrenia really is. 
It's not something that I had a deep understanding of before. And really, was one of the reasons I think I really like this book. I'm really pleased I read it because I feel I can understand what it is. I can't understand what it's like to have it. I think that's impossible unless you've actually got it. But I can understand what it what it is in a much better way. And also the consequences. Because one of the things that you hear is obviously Laurie talking about the voices and the things that voices say. I mean, I don't think I could or would have the ability to ignore them for as long as she does. Yeah, the resilience that she has and the perseverance to ignore those voices for as long as she can and to try and just get on with being Laurie. And then it's only when they just get too much, she ends up attempting suicide. And, you know, because she also knows that every time she does that, they seem to to fade away for a bit, which... To me, we've seen before in other books that attempting suicide seems to improve symptoms for a while. And I don't know why this is. And if there's a psychologist out there who can explain to us, that would be great. But it does seem to be a pattern that we have seen in other places. It's interesting that why that might happen. Is it because psychologically she's given in to them so they obey? Is it because she's then more medicated because she's in the hospital? I don't know. But it is very, it, I think it's very interesting that that seems to be a A common phenomenon yeah but she 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 ends up in this cycle and where she tries to cope she tries to get on with being normal as we you know if normal even exists but again fed by the stigmas and the the we're told to get back to the life that you had before she does change jobs she does try different things but she finds it hard to declare what she's got to her employers even but again that's because of the stigma associated back then And to be honest, I don't know if I would necessarily admit to a mental health condition now, which is extremely distressing in some ways, because you need the support, you need the people around you to understand that in some situations, it's just going to be difficult for you. Yeah. Well, there's some some jobs you're not allowed if you've ever had a mental health illness. You know, if it's on your records, you might not be allowed to have that job and I think if you're accepting help and you're trying and you're coping you know why should you be penalized unless it is something that is ongoing I don't know it's it's tricky I think maybe it needs to be done on an individual basis yeah but even like um recently I was signed off work for anxiety and the, the GP said to me is it okay to put anxiety on the sick note as if Actually, you wanted it, to hide it. Is it okay to let your work know this is the reason you are sick, even though this is the reason you are sick? Yeah. And I found that I, I just said, yeah, because I'm open and honest about it and I will deal with the consequences. But if, and I've even been, you know, family members even said to me, this, this might affect my future career. Which it shouldn't in any way, shape or form. No. And I feel Laurie sees that and feels that. And so when she does get new jobs, even in a medical setting, she doesn't feel she can die. She can ex- disclose her diagnosis. Particularly because she does end up working with people with mental health. Yeah. And you would have thought that in some ways that's going to make her more empathetic to the people around her and the people that she's dealing with. Which is one of the good things about the later part of this book, where she does work in, the, in those areas and they do know and she, it's used as a benefit to help her that she actually has been through things and can actually speak from experience. Yeah, and that that and she can help people by saying, "I was where you were," and I, you know, I do know what those voices feel and sound like, even though they are different for each person. But it is nice that she that she feels that she can design a career around her experiences, and they are valued, you know, and not not stigmatized. So we've discussed quite a bit about Laurie's parents. So I thought maybe we should talk a bit about her brothers, Mark and Stephen. So Mark is her younger brother, but is the eldest out of the two. And then there's Stephen, who is the youngest out of all of them. Yeah. And Mark actually is the one that idolises Laurie since they were kids. And he's just so shocked when he sees what she's like. And he kind of ends up sort of detaching himself from the family not wanting to be around them because he doesn't want to see it he doesn't want to accept that what's going on he thinks that she'll just snap out of it she'll come home and you don't hear much about him but he is he is the character that 
kind of stays away from it. But later on in the book, he is still around and it's difficult for the family members to deal with. But later on, he is very supportive of her. Yeah, when he's accepted it as well, he does become very supportive and and realises that this is long term, this is what it's going to be like. But at the same time, it's still Laurie. And I think that's the thing that people see the diagnosis and they forget that that is the same person that it was before. Yeah, and the benefit for him is that he is away at college during the time that she is hospitalised. So he has this ability to distance himself from the family easier than the younger brother, who is only 16 when Laurie first goes into the hospital. And at that point, he finds it very difficult to deal with. Yeah, he, he doesn't think she should. He thinks it's the wrong choice. He thinks... He can't imagine his sister in hospital. He thinks his parents have made the wrong decision. But then also, when it is becoming more serious and it's all happening, because of this environment of don't talk about it, blush it under the under the carpet, he they no one talks to him about it. No one, you know, explains to him what's going along. And as a result, he becomes isolated, alone. He also resents the attention that Laurie's getting. Um, which she needs at this point. She needs the support from her parents. Yeah. However, it seems that because they're going away and seeing Laurie and he doesn't see it as them visiting Laurie, they, he sees it as them working and stuff, that he starts to resent the fact that life has changed. Yeah. He also, because he doesn't understand what's going on or, or what what's occurring... He also becomes scared that he might happen to him as well. Well, we all have seen or we have at least read within the literature that there is a genetic component associated with schizophrenia and that you are more likely to suffer with the condition yourself if a close family member has already been diagnosed with it. Yeah. So he has this fear that he could be the one that's next because he does, again, also idolises Laurie and he wants to be her in some respects yeah and especially i think when nancy the mother starts to realize and that she has seen some of these symptoms before yeah i think the key point for nancy is when they're in one of the hospitals and she is looking at laurie and laurie is wearing this vacant expression and she's like hang on a minute i've seen this before i've seen the impacts of something similar and then she's like oh my goodness it's my mum yeah And her mum used to disappear on regular intervals um, to go and visit a cousin in Florida to rest. But actually, there was no cousin and it was Christian science healer that she was visiting. And so she starts seeing that this is actually, she has seen this and this was on and off and this was long term. And I think that almost helps her to accept what she's going through as a serious long term illness because she has seen it before and has seen that this happened but also finds it hard to accept that her daughter is like her mother. I also think it's really quite difficult for her to understand and accept because she went through all of this as a child and the amount of embarrassment that she felt and that was surrounding her mother's behaviour, that she felt that other family members used it as some way to discredit her mother. Does that make sense? Yeah, they were saying that she was only doing it, these fainting spells or, you know, behaviour she was exhibiting was due to her wanting to get attention. And, you know, this is not an attention-seeking desire. This is a mental health illness. Yeah. And then she also realises that she's also seen it in another family member, her cousin Sylvia. Yeah, who is named Crazy as a Loon. You know, which just shows you how... The stigma. Yeah, and the embarrassment and the fear and, and you didn't want to be like her, you know. And she was also described, she's described as fat and suddenly and wore shoes with holes and cut out bunions and calluses. And I think this scares Nancy because then she thinks, well, what life is my daughter going to have? I would be terrified. If she's going to be Sylvia. I would be terrified for my child. Yeah. And so... You know, she's worried, partly, I think, for the embarrassment for her and her family, but I think she's just really scared for her daughter, that her daughter is going to become what her mother was, but also become what Sylvia, this cousin, was as well, the loon of the village, which, you know, is the stigma that is often portrayed, that actually there is, 
you know, the crazy person who walks around with light holes in their shoes and, you know, talks to themselves. And that's what this this stigma is described as. The stereotype of schizophrenia is somebody going around talking to themselves and, and talking back to voices that aren't there. And, and that's not what is, this is not what Laurie is experiencing. And not where she ends up, which I'm really pleased at the end of the book where we see that she finds somebody who can actually accept her for who she is and, and love her for such. Yeah. So the turning point really for Laurie is when they all seem to start recognising the fact that she does have this mental illness and that it is probably going to be a part of her life forever. It's not going to get cured as such, but she will be able to manage the symptoms that she is having. And also the fact that this fantastic brand new medicine comes available that she can then petition the doctors at the hospital to get. Yeah, and and the doctors actually are the ones that turn around and say to her, this isn't about getting rid of the voices. This is the first time they've really said, it's not about getting rid, it's about managing. And it's about managing the condition in a long-term way. All of her stays in these hospitals seems to have been trying to get her to have a short-term fix and then get out and be normal. Get out and do it on yourself, yeah. Whereas now they're actually, I think through the history of the medical uh, mental health service improving, actually saying to her, no, this is about managing it. This is about getting you to a point where you can live the life you want to lead with the voices, but with them dulled down to a point where you can actually tolerate what's going on. And it is about, I think, a daily struggle with what she's dealing with. And it's also a change in the way that she is treated. So when she goes into the long-term facility, she uh, seems to be actually treated like a human being. Whereas before, she was more... I don't know, it was very difficult to read the way that they treated her before they highly medicated her they shoved her in cold baths yeah they put her in the quiet room so that she would get rid of the rage and the attention seeking behavior they electrocuted her they gave her electric shock treatment that wasn't necessarily helpful to her they really didn't treat her very well and it's only when dr dollar comes on the scene and i love the her surname dr dollar it's great she is so open and honest with Laurie that things really start to improve. Yeah, and I, I think as well, the the one thing is that because this new miracle drug that they see that comes out, you know, there are a lot of people that probably would have, the medication she'd had earlier would have worked for them and they would have been maybe treated better. But none of the medication that was available before worked for Laurie. None of it actually made any difference, really. Yeah, and if it did, it was either made her too sort of spaced out or made her feel different or none of it actually faded the voices until this drug comes along that she tries. But there's real risks with it. It's still in experimental stages, but they petition to have it. And this makes a, this is a big difference for her, which shows us, I think, that accepting your condition is one thing, but actually having the right medication or the right mixture of medication is a massive massive a point at which you can actually help you to actually cope with these the, these mental health illnesses so we keep saying this drug so this drug was called clozapine and it was the first new antipsychotic drug that had been released in the 1980s since thorazine which was released in the 1950s so this was really a breakthrough drug yeah and it helped people who weren't helped by any of the other medications and so this is why Laurie thinks actually this sounds like a good idea. And she hears about it from other patients and, and around the hospital where she, she hears that there's a new drug going on. But it was also dangerous. There are some incredible side effects, which does include death. Yeah. And though it had gone through testing, and it, but it had to be slowly given... The dosage had to be given raised slowly. She also had to come off other medication to be able to even go on it in the first place, which would cause problems and withdrawal symptoms and an increase in her her symptoms anyway. And then then it's got to be carefully added to her bloodstream and slowly added um, increased as she got used to the different doses. And they needed to watch her closely because I said one of the side effects was death. But I think one of the most telling things out of all of this is the the reaction that her dad has to when she basically begs them to give her this new medication. And he says, and I quote, You've got no choice but to try this drug, Marvin chimed in. If it kills her, well, maybe she's better off dead. Yeah, which, 
what a sentiment. Sounds horrific and is a horrific thing to say about your own child. The, you know, that actually maybe they are better, better off. off dead than in the state that they currently are in. Because we see an escalation in her symptoms when she is admitted to the hospital or one of the other hospitals that she's admitted to. And her behaviour is so difficult for staff members to handle. I mean, during the time that we read the book, we hear of her getting cold, wet packing, which I think sounds like the most horrific of treatments that anyone could undergo. So a cold, wet packing is a form of restraint that was used to calm violent patients and patients that were out of control. And it would quieten down most people under the influence of other methods. If the quiet room wasn't enough to keep the patients from hurting themselves, then they were also given tranquilizers and temporarily put into a two-point restraints with their wrists tied. And there was also four-point restraints where wrists and ankles were bound to the bed. But sometimes patients were strapped onto a jerry for geriatric chairs, which were little wheeled contraptions used for propping up old people. Which, Laurie says, she broke three of these. And so the only thing that will actually help her by this point and that this staff actually know will will actually calm her down was was the the cold, cold wet packing. And the idea of the cold, wet pack was to chill the patient thoroughly and so the body struggled to warm itself and so the energy that the body needed to heat itself would calm the person down. So they'd stop struggling, which... I, I hate being cold at the best of times, but this sounds absolutely horrific. Um, horrific. So they were mandated a full two hours as a freezing mummy, basically. They would be there checking their vital signs the whole way through because it, it was dangerous as well. They would be wrapped in wet, cold, wet sheets and mummified up into, you know, and left to, to basically wait until they calmed. And if they were deemed calm enough, they would then be demummified, as Laurie says, and she would then end up as a freezing, wet and cramped and feeling embarrassed, degraded and demeaned by the whole process that she had just gone through. And I'm not surprised. I mean, how awful would that be? Because they basically pin her down, strip her naked, wrap her in these cold, wet, freezing sheets and leave her for two hours. And if they didn't think that she was going to be calm when they released her they gave her another two hours so imagine four hours being wrapped up as a cold freezing mummy yeah and it's it's the fact that they have to strip her in that as well i mean just being just having these big burly strong men because that's what they need to be strong enough to do this because she is gets to the point where she is so violent that it takes that many people just to pin her down yeah so they actually you know, strip her naked. And although they are medical professionals, that's still such a degrading thing to have happen to you, especially for somebody who's been through sexual assault. You know, she's been through things where she isn't going to be, this is not going to be in any way a comfortable or, you know, calming experience for her. I mean, it does help her. It does work in that for those short times, it calms her down. But it doesn't really... It's not face any of the solution. other things that is, yeah, exactly it's not the thing that she'd be dealing with the voices and helping her to deal with the anger and her out of control outbursts well it's fact that the, the, i mean this book is called the quiet room partly because one she of ended the, up in there so often one of the treatments is that they do just shove her in a, in a room to be quiet and there's nothing to do so eventually she will have to just sit and calm down you know it's, it's the whole padded cell treatment which is again horrific yeah, it is really horrific. And it comes back to, you know, this this history of the mental health services and and you know, people say that we've we've made improvements and we have, but there's still so much going on that is it sounds similar to what we're seeing here. But this drug works for Laurie. Yes. And her symptoms start to lessen. And so as a combination of drug therapy, so the clozapine, and also her continual psychotherapy with her psychiatrist dr fisher so i think that's kind of it for the discussions about the the book itself and now it really really i would like to sort of talk about how the portrayal has helped me to understand about schizophrenia and i think it's a book that i've actually recommended to a lot of people and like i said it's one of my favorites that we've read in that i think it is so well it it portrays the the 
the mental health illness so well. So this one was recommended to me by my therapist because I was talking about made you up with her and she suggested that if I wanted to get a better understanding of schizophrenia that I should try the quiet room and I think we're going to do a separate episode about comparing made you up with the quiet room whereas one is obviously fact and one is fiction but I do think I agree with Becky this book was extremely enlightening in comparison to made you up which may have really glamorized the fact that schizophrenia is actually not too bad but if you read the quiet room I must admit I'm like no way I don't think I could have anywhere near coped as well as Laurie does even though there's obviously points where she isn't coping well I couldn't do it I don't think I would be able to handle it it is it it really is an eye-opener for me to to get a better understanding of what schizophrenia is and although we do talk about how different people have different experiences you know in the blurb itself it does say this is a kind of classic example of what has happened over the years and and although the early treatment is happening in the 80s as we've said there are there are new medications there are new treatments since this since Laurie started getting treatment but I wouldn't necessarily say that things have completely turned around particularly in terms of stigma I still think that schizophrenia is probably one of the most stigmatized mental health conditions that a person can suffer with yeah I would agree I think it is misunderstood and it is stereotyped in a way through media and through portrayals in TV and film and entertainment that make it very hard to understand it properly unless you do something like read one of these books. I would recommend it. So please do have a read. Thank you to Laurie for sharing her story. I think it is really profound and it was hard very, hitting. very insightful for, for, for me personally. As I said, I found at points I found it quite difficult to read just purely because of some of the things and the hell that Laurie faces or has faced during the time that she is diagnosed with schizophrenia and then has to work her way through to getting back to what she now is doing with her life. The fact that she has now got a partner, the fact that she now is living the life that she wants to live. So anyway, that was The Quiet Room. We will do another episode that will compare Made You Up to The Quiet Room. But for now, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you feel that you need additional support with your mental health, please call the Samaritans on 116123 which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next podcast episode will be a bonus episode where we discussed Made You Up and The Quiet Room. And our next book will be Etched On Me by Jen Crowell. You can find out more by visiting our website, which is mentalhealthbookclub.com. We would really love to hear what you think about this podcast. Please get in touch with us at our Facebook page, which is the Mental Health Book Club, or at our Twitter, which is at MHBC underscore podcast. And if you like the podcast, please share it with your family and friends and leave us a five star rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can further show your support by contributing to the Mental Health Book Club podcast at Patreon by visiting patreon.com forward slash MHBC.